Well, it is a privilege. I've already introduced him uh, to you, but it's a privilege to have the Reverend John Shaw here with us today, uh, especially as he's here to preach uh, the word of the Lord. So I invite him up to the pulpit now, and uh, thank you, John, for being here, brother. It's such a privilege to be with you this morning, to be able to worship with you, to sing together, to lift our voices in prayer together, to hear uh, from God's Word together as well. I do want to just greet you and thank you for uh, your support of the work of missions in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, both uh, foreign missions and home missions. Thank you for uh, your giving, but especially thankful for your prayers. Uh, It's a good reminder that When we pray to God, we're doing something of significance. God actually hears and answers those prayers. And so as the church prays for laborers, when we see new churches planted or new missionaries sent, those are answers uh, to prayers that we've lifted up to our God. So thank you for that and for your participation in that work. Uh, We do have the privilege right now of turning to the the word of our God and hearing uh, his word to us. I'd ask you to do that first of all. I'm going to make a slight addition to what's in the bulletin. If you could turn, first of all, in the New Testament uh, to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm just going to read a few verses here. Verses 1 through 6. This is uh, Paul's reflections at one point in time uh, on his ministry and the gospel that he's called to proclaim and the glorious nature of what happens when the gospel is preached and By the Holy Spirit, veils are removed, and we see the glory of God uh, revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let's listen carefully, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 6, remembering that this is the very word of our God. Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways, We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then please turn. In the Old Testament to the book of Psalms, this is our text for this morning, Psalm 27. This is, as it says in the title, the Psalm of David, written, as we clearly see in the psalm, at a time of crisis and conflict, but it, it's also a psalm of praise, even in the midst of that conflict. So let's hear again the word of God, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. 
And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Thus ends the reading of God's perfect word. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, how kind you've been to us. That you give us your word. That we can know that as we read from the pages of Scripture. These are the very words of our God, the one who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in it, who made promises and always keeps them. And we ask, Lord God, that even now as we consider your word, that by the power of your spirit at work in us, by your word, that you would make us ready and able to believe your promises and to keep your commandments. We pray this in the good name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. September 11th, 2001. That's a date most of us remember in some way, right? A significant moment in the history of our nation, a time of a darkness and despair in many ways. And one of the events I remember soon after, just a few days later, was a national day of prayer and a prayer service held in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Reading of scripture, singing of, of hymns and psalms, crying out to God in a time of distress that we would see his light. And one of the things I remember vividly from that service was the reading of this very psalm, Psalm 27, fitting, right, for the time in which we found ourselves, a time of darkness in which we're looking for the light of the salvation of our God. But what I remember specifically about the reading of that psalm was who read it. It was read by a Jewish rabbi. And I remember thinking as he's reading that first verse that I'm hearing something very different than what he's hearing. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Can't help but think of Jesus when you hear those words. The Lord is my light. Maybe it causes us to look forward to John 8 verse 12 when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He is our light. And the Lord is my salvation so that Paul can say to the Philippian jailer believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved this psalm is driving us toward hope and confidence in Jesus as we read the Old Testament and the Psalms it's pointing us driving us fixing our eyes on the person and work of Jesus who is a perfect Savior for those who put their trust in him. How much of that David understood, we don't know, but he looked forward to the promise of a Savior who would bring perfect salvation for the people of God. That's what we're reading about in Psalm 27. It's indeed a psalm written 
in the midst of conflict, driving the people of God toward confidence and courage in their God, a fixed gaze on the glory of God. And I think we can understand it to be a fixed gaze on the glory of God, which is found in the beautiful face of Jesus Christ. That's what we'll consider this morning as we look at this psalm. We need to understand the context of the psalm, even the original context in which it was written. And we'll see that in three different ways. It's a psalm of conflict, it's a psalm of confidence, and it's a psalm of courage. First of all, it's a psalm of conflict. We know, as we saw in the title, this is a psalm of David. It's written at a specific time in his life when he is in danger. He's on the run, and his life is threatened. We see that again and again in the verses of this psalm. Look at verse 2. He says, When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they're seeking to destroy him. Verse 3, he says, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. He goes on in verse 5 to talk about being hidden in the shelter of his God in the day of trouble, being concealed under the cover of his tent. Or verse 6, his head being lifted up above my enemies, enemies who have surrounded him on every side. And then you can almost hear the despair of verse 10. He's alone, forsaken. Even my father and my mother have forsaken me. And his adversaries are seeking to destroy him. Verse 12, false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. His life is literally on the line. That's the context in which he writes. It's a moment of conflict and threat and potentially a moment that could lead to despair. That's the circumstance in which David writes. But of course, as we read the Psalms of David and as we read of the life of David, we're pointed not simply to David, but also pointed forward to that great son of David, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's prefigured for us in this Psalm. Can't you hear his experience? In verse 10, alone, forsaken, his brothers have left him behind. His disciples have scattered as he hangs on the cross. Only his mother and one disciple there. He's alone and forsaken. And you can hear his experience as well in verse 12. False witnesses, lies being spoken about him, breathing out violence, even hanging him there on the cross. It's a psalm of David, but it's a psalm as well of Jesus, our Savior. But it's also a psalm for us. It's a psalm for you. It's a psalm for Christians. We're promised many things by our Savior Jesus, but one of the things we're promised is suffering, opposition, and adversaries. Do you remember the words of Jesus to his disciples in John 15, verses 18 through 20? If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He goes on to say, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This is part of the character of the Christian life. You remember how the Beatitudes, those blessings at the beginning of Matthew 5 end. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The world in which we live is for the believer a place of conflict, sometimes of division, sometimes of strife. The Christian life is described by our Savior as taking up your cross daily and following in the footsteps of your Master. We're told that sometimes the call of the Gospel creates division in families between father and mother, brother and sister, that we're given a, a sword that sometimes divides and creates conflict. This is 
the character of the Christian life. And so this psalm, a psalm of conflict, is a psalm for you and a psalm for me. You can even hear the battle with sin, I think, as we read the words of verse 2, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Can't you hear the echo of the assault of sin, the decay of death that's even at work in us at this very moment? The devil who seeks to devour us. And so this psalm of conflict is a psalm for the Christian today that points us to our Savior who suffered and died in our place and who is a perfect, empathetic, sympathetic high priest who's with us in our suffering. It's a psalm of conflict. But it's also, in the midst of conflict, a psalm of confidence. And we see that right away in verse 1. We have images here of confidence for the believer. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. He's light in a dark place. He's salvation for those who are lost. He's a stronghold for those who are threatened. But notice as well that these aren't simply abstract images. They're made personal for us even in how they're expressed in verse 1. It doesn't say the Lord is light. It says the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. He's the stronghold of my life. This is a personal God who loves His people, who knows them by name and knows their suffering more than they know it themselves. He's a personal Savior for sinners. So that... So that David can ask these questions. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? And he can assume the answer. No one and nothing should cause fear for the people of God. He even points us both backwards and forwards and giving us confidence in the midst of conflict. Verse 2 seems to be pointing to past events when he's seen the Lord bring deliverance when evildoers assailed me or assailed me to eat up my flesh when adversaries and foes surrounded me I saw them stumble and fall their plot brought to an end but he also looks forward in verse 3 though an army encamp against me my heart shall not fear though war arise against me I will be confident He's proven himself to be faithful. I know he will be faithful to me again and again because he's a perfect savior. Matthew Henry, in writing about verse 3, describes it in this way, that David is triumphing before the victory. He knows God will save him again and again. And he goes on to say that David is simply expressing faith described in Hebrews as the confidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. We have confidence in our God. But David gives us one more image that should provide for us confidence in our faithful God. And it's what we find in verses 4 through 6, repeated in a variety of ways. He points us to the place where he finds confidence, the tent and the tabernacle of his God. He says in verse 4, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I might gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple, the meeting place where God dwells in, among, and with his people. He goes on in verse 5 to say, He will hide me in His shelter. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent or of His tabernacle. He'll lift up my head, verse 6, and I will offer in His tent, His tabernacle, sacrifices with shouts of praise. David is reminded again and again, even though in the eyes of the world it seems like all hope is gone, he's reminded that God is faithful and that God remains with His people always and to the end of the age. So that even when father and mother forsake Him, in verse 10, the Lord remains. 
the Lord is faithful. So it's a psalm of conflict. It's a psalm of confidence. But it's also a psalm of courage. And we see that in the last two verses. Verse 13. David says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. There's a sense in which David's giving himself a pep talk. I do believe this. I remember it to be true. He's telling himself, remember? God is faithful. I believe that he will fulfill his promises. Maybe you've heard this cheer. I'm not sure it's as prevalent as it was a few years ago, but especially at soccer games and football games, uh, this cheer where at the beginning of the game, the fans chant to each other, I believe. I believe, they repeat it over and over again, I believe that we will win. It's a pep talk at the beginning of the game, reminding themselves that we have confidence, right? That, that, that our team will be victorious. That's something, a small glimpse of what David's doing here. He's pointing himself to his confidence in the faithfulness of his God so that he can have courage when he would be tempted to give up. I believe. And notice... Notice that he even finds confidence in the promise of a resurrection. I think that's what's happening in verse 13. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Even as he brings me through death, so that I can look upon the face of my God. So that even if this suffering should bring me to death, there is hope, confidence, and courage in the resurrection power of his God. I believe that God is faithful even to the end. And then it leads to this beautiful expression of courage at uh, the end of the psalm in verse 14. I think in the midst of conflict surrounded by his enemies, there's probably not a clearer expression of courage than what David says and does in verse 14. He says, wait for the Lord. He patiently, quietly waits for the Lord to prove himself to be faithful. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. We even have just glimpses even in how he, 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 he names God. In verse 1 and verse 14, brackets and bookends in this psalm. In the middle of the psalm, he calls God in different ways, uh, God and Lord, but he begins and ends with a double expression of this Name and title for God, the Lord in all capital letters, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who proves again and again that when he makes promises, he always keeps them. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So this is a psalm of confidence and courage in the midst of conflict. But it leaves us, I think, with a question. And it's simply this. How is that possible? To have courage and confidence in the midst of great persecution. And I think we find the answer at what I believe to be the, the center of this psalm in verse 4. Let's look there. Verse 4 of Psalm 27. He says, One thing have I asked of the Lord. And we'll talk about that one thing in a second. But notice, first of all, just this expression, one thing. He has a focused perspective, a fixed gaze, one simple priority, and really there's nothing else in second place. One thing that fixes his attention so that when the world is at war all around him, he can fix his gaze in that one place. One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What a beautiful expression of faith in God. I think it's one of these uh, beautiful images, one of the most beautiful images in Scripture of a fixed gaze on God. But it's especially beautiful when you remember the context that we've already discussed. Enemies and adversaries surrounding him. His friends and family have forsaken him. His life is literally on the line. This isn't a, a restful Lord's Day afternoon when everything is peaceful and quiet. 
The world is raging all around him. And David is able to stop and fix his gaze on one place. Now I can imagine what my one thing might be if I find my, found myself in David's shoes. Deliverance, right? Victory against his enemies. Salvation from a difficult place. Protection of his life. Maybe a return to his own house from which he's been chased so that he can worship in the house of his God. Maybe restoration of relationships with his family. All of those things are certainly on his mind. But there's one thing and one thing alone that drives him. We all have our if onlys, don't we? Our conditions, if only, Lord, you would provide for me a better job, more financial security, a better family relationship, a better relationship with my spouse, a peaceful home, healthy marriage. If only, Lord, you would give me those things, then I could fix my gaze upon you. We get it all twisted around. But David's one thing, the thing that drives him, his chief end, his last end, the center of his very existence is fellowship with God. And notice that it's not the gifts that God gives, it's God himself that calls for David's fixed gaze to be able to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to fix his gaze on his Savior, to look upon the beautiful face of his God, to meditate on the glories and the majesty of his God. And you see that David is pursuing that with the whole of his being. He's not simply receding it. He's preoccupied with it. He's crying out for it. He's obsessed with knowing more of communion with God. We see it in verse 4. He says, one thing have I asked of the Lord. He's crying out to God. He's pleading with Him. In verse 7, he says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. And then he really does cry out to God. He says, you've said, seek my face, my heart. In other words, my whole being is crying out to you, Lord, your face I seek. Hide not your face from me. Cast me not off. O God of my salvation. And do you notice the personal nature of of David's request? That he would see the face and gaze upon the beauty of the almighty, eternal, and infinite God. To look upon his face, to gaze upon his beauty. Maybe an illustration helps us to, to think about the personal nature of what he's asking. A little over 25 years ago, a couple months after I was engaged uh, to my wife, we were still in college, and uh, she spent a semester in Cyprus. I spent a semester in D.C. And so for three months, we couldn't see each other. This, of course, some of you know this. Some of you might be surprised by this. This was before we had cell phones, before we had FaceTime, before we had Zoom. I had a calling card that was really expensive, and so we talked on the phone five to ten minutes a week, and we wrote letters by hand and I can remember when those letters would arrive I'm in a in a a house with 25 other college students that that letter came I stopped what I was doing I went to my room I shut the door I opened the letter and I read it three or four times I love those letters but I also remember as I read those letters thinking this as much as I love these letters what I really want to do I want to look on her face I want to see her That's what David is crying out to his God, who he has not yet seen, but who he knows and who he loves. He's crying out to God and saying, I want to see your face, to gaze upon your beauty, and to know your glory and your majesty in deep, intimate, personal ways. And that is a good desire. And it's what God desires For us, and I think we can say as well that it's a very much a New Testament desire for believers to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. If you would just briefly turn back to 2 Corinthians 4, I think this is at the very heart of 
the gospel, this desire to see the glory of God and to look on his face. So remember, 2 Corinthians 4 begins by describing what it means to be an unbeliever, to have that veil in front of your face where you can't see or know or understand God. And the ministry of the gospel is to have the gospel proclaim the Holy Spirit at work so that that veil is removed. That's what's being described for us here. And if you look there in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, it says this, In their case, the, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. And then listen to this image of what it means to turn to God by the power of the gospel. He says, for God, the same God who said, let light shine out of darkness. And what happened? There was light. That same God, by that same powerful voice, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. Is that your desire? And maybe even more difficult to answer, do you believe it's even possible? I'm here to tell you it is. That by the power of the gospel and by the power of the crucified and risen Savior, you can know the beauty of God as you see it displayed in the person, work, and face of Jesus, if you would simply put your trust in Him. And as we close this morning, we even see in this psalm several tools that God in His mercy gives us so that we can look on the beauty of God in the face of Jesus. And we'll consider them just briefly. First of all, he tells us that we can see the glory of God in the face of Jesus by what we're doing right now, right here in this place. Worship, and in particular, corporate worship with the people of God. Don't we see that all over this psalm, especially in the images of tabernacle and temple? One thing, verse 4, have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire, to meditate in his temple, which is now the church of Jesus Christ, the house of the living God. It goes on to say in verse 6 that his head would be lifted up above his enemies and he would offer in his tent, in his tabernacle, sacrifices with shouts of joy. I know some of you, even this morning, are asking the question, has God removed his face from me? Why does it feel as if God is so far from me? And one of the ways that he draws near to you is in worship. Even this morning, as the word is preached, as the people of God lift their voices in praise and in prayer, God shows his face in his son. So he gives us worship, but he also gives us his word. That image in verse 4 of inquiring in his temple, gazing upon the beauty of the Lord, it's not that he's telling us someday in the far off distant future we'd be able to look on the glories of our God and Savior. He's telling us right now as you inquire in his temple, and in particular I think is implied as you read and study the word of God where Jesus is proclaimed to you. You can see the glory of God in the crucified and risen Savior. I think we see that especially clearly in verse 11 when he says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path. This is imagery we find all over the book of Psalms, especially in a place like Psalm 119. How do we know and follow the path of God? We do it as we read and study and meditate on his word as he reveals himself to us in the scriptures. So he gives us worship, he gives us his word, and he gives us as well prayer. Isn't that what we see David doing in verses 7 and 8 as he feels as if there's a distance, as he's been separated from his God? He cries out. He cries aloud. He pleads with his God. Show your face to me. Should you find yourself now or at some other time in a, a difficult circumstance where you wonder, has God removed his presence from me. Brothers and sisters, know 
that you can cry out to God in prayer and plead his promises back to him just as David does here. He longs to show you his face. And if you cry out to God, I promise you that because God is faithful, he will answer that prayer. Cry out to him and seek his face. Lastly, we see not so much a tool, but a gift that God gives us as the psalm comes to a conclusion in verse 13 and 14. Again, it says there, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you have an English Standard Version, you might have a note at the bottom where it gives another translation. I think it's helpful where it says something like this, had I not believed, and then the sentence doesn't finish. In other words, without faith and confidence in God, I have nothing. But as I turn to him in faith and confidence, I have everything because I have him. It's a call to faith, to receive and rest in Christ as he's offered to us in the gospel. And to know that as we trust in him, he loves us in such a way that he shows himself to us in clearer and clearer ways until that day when we stand in the land of the living and look upon his face no longer in faith but in sight as we look upon the face of our glorious Savior, Jesus. May that be our prayer and our confidence even this day that we might know the beauty of God and his glorious majesty as we trust in his Son. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for speaking to us clearly in your word, for speaking to us even in our circumstances of difficulty and frustration and trial and pointing us to your perfect work for us in Christ. Lord God, our prayer is the same as David's. You promised us, Lord, to show your face. We ask that you would not hide your face from us, that you would not turn from us in anger, but that we would know your glorious grace and love revealed to us in your son and that you would show us more of your beauty even right now as we call out to you we pray this with confidence because we pray in the name of our risen savior with whom we're seated by faith in heavenly places we pray in his name amen